So I, I want to begin the afternoon with a small confession, which is, is that I exaggerated the truth when I was giving you my tweezer story. I actually wasn't agitated at all about the cactus. And, and even though I was delighted by the way the devas sent MJ just at exactly the right time and she ended up getting me a pair of tweezers, I, whether I was able to get this, this, the cactus spines out of my hands or not, I was not agitated, I was not distressed. And I'm quite confident that even if I had to have them in my hands all night long, it, yeah. I would have probably been a little uncomfortable and not slept so well, but there was no movement of mind. So I used it because it was useful, exaggerating the truth and making a, an identification of the body as a way of explaining how that works. But I also wanted to spend some time now talking about what happens when there's enough mindfulness present where we can be with unpleasant feeling and watch the, you know, yeah, I want to get the spines out of my hands, but there was no agitation around it. There was no story or drama. There was no clinging. There was no grasping. And whether it happened or it didn't happen, I was quite confident that I was going to be fine. And I want to tell a couple more stories about that. One recent and one that I've heard in the distant past. Um, there was a, a pair of mountain climbers and they went, I don't exactly remember which part of the world. Chile? Yeah. And they were in high mountains. I think they were over 22,000 feet. And they'd made some kind of an error of judgment somewhere and they ended up staying out and, and um, got into trouble. And one of the consequences of getting into trouble was is, is that one of, the, one of the climbing people fell and broke his leg. He had a compound fracture. So they're at like 22,000 feet in the mountains in Chile. And, and effectively, the partner said to him, you're screwed. You know, the one who was healthy said to the one with a broken leg, you're screwed. But being his partner, his climbing partner, you know, he didn't just leave him there. He did what he could to help him get out. And so they had like a 7,000 foot face that they had to belay down, which they managed to do. And then they got to another thing. And and somehow or another, the belay, his, the one who had the broken leg got stuck. And he was pulling the partner with him. So he couldn't see him, he couldn't talk to him, he had no idea what was happening, he was on the end of this rope. And so the healthy partner took his knife and cut the rope. So the injured partner, who's got a compound fracture leg, falls into a crevasse, okay? And he couldn't get out of the crevasse. So he had the genius to go further into the crevasse. And by going further into the crevasse, he found a way out. And by a phenomenal level of determination and clear thinking, because any tiny little pressure on his leg with the compound fracture was almost so excruciating that he would pass out. So he had to do this very carefully he would count the number of steps and then shift his weight and then count the number of steps and shift his weight. So effectively what he was doing was he was counting himself through the pain, okay? And he had to go from like 19,000 feet down to where the base camp was, which was like 15,000 feet on a compound fractured leg. I mean, it was not pleasant, you know? There was no doubt about it. This was not a pleasant experience. And when he arrived, he passed out, and then, and then there was a big thing, and they ended up finding him. So he, was, he, he survived the journey. And when they found him, he was not fresh as a daisy flower. You know, he was a mess, and it was all infected. But the point of the story, and it's really an important point of the story, is he refused to accept the fact that he was screwed. He didn't accept it. 
he was waiting for what's opening, where are the nuances, where is the possibility, what can I do this step, what can I do this step, what can I do this step, where can I do this step. So he wasn't looking at the big picture and looking at this is an impossible situation, there's no way I'm going to be able to get out of it. How can I make the next step? Where is the next step? Where is the next step? And so from the top of the mountain all the way to where he collapsed, that's what he did. What is the next step? He refused to accept that he was screwed. Now, dialing this a little bit closer to home, my beloved Sharon and I ended up stuck in the sand. And the first thing that happened when we registered that we are stuck in the sand is a man came running towards us hollering at the top of his lungs saying you trespassed you jumped the boundary what are you doing in my space you guys are screwed I'm not helping you and you're screwed like that with that level of care and kindness and respect and Sharon and I looked at each other and I didn't feel screwed, and she didn't feel screwed, and we were not at all convinced we were screwed. So she was lovely about apologizing, and I, you know, I, I had a, a half a thing of water. We had we had food in the car. I had one bar on my cell phone that was operating. I didn't feel screwed. So we refused to accept that we were screwed. So what do we need to do? So we had a plan. We called a this one and a that one, and then we talked to this one. And then the wife came out and was very kind and solicitous and brought us water and nudged us to come in the shade and nudged us again to come in the shade. And we were a little bit frightened to go in the shade because there was this growly husband (laughs) that had just come from the shade. So she had to talk to Jill on the phone who basically demanded that we come into the air-conditioned place because... We were in the heat. We were afraid we were going to get overheated. But at no point did I feel screwed. I refused to accept that. There was not even an entertaining of that as an option. That was not my experience, that I was screwed. So how does this relate to what we're at? It has actually a huge impact because the cycle operates when we believe and grab hold of and identify. When we don't believe, grab hold of and identify, it happens, it arises, we know it and it passes. There isn't this whole cycle of suffering that follows in the wake. Yes, it can be unpleasant and sometimes it can be very unpleasant, but it's different from the addition of the suffering that we add to it, the story we (coughs) create on top of the unpleasantness. You with me? Yeah, following. So, whether we're screwed or we're not screwed actually has less to do with the circumstance and a whole lot more to do with the way we're relating to it. And our ability to drop in and finesse the space around what's happening. Now, I want to change talk and bring more, a little bit more, the thread, one thread of what I was talking about last night into the conversation and then see how that goes in terms of the next contemplation. So craving comes in many different forms and I was speaking about the Buddha's descriptions of the craving for sensuality, the craving for becoming, and the craving for non-becoming. One of the cravings that we, are, we have is the craving for relational, well, it's a relational craving. Okay, And I've heard expressions of that. I want more contact. I want it to last longer. I want feedback. I want this. I want that. There's a craving, a hunger for something that is a relational experience. Or the other day when Sharon was giving the guidance and she was talking about the feeling of you're going to die. You're going to die if you don't get to finish what it is you want to say. You know, or the, the the horses just just at the at the gates. They're about to they're about to launch when there's the opportunity to to speak. Yeah. So there's craving. There's relational cravings that we have. 
And I've never been in a situation where relational cravings were taught as natural and things to know about and name and, and track. That's new, really, for me. But I went last night and I checked out Marshall Rosenberg because I know he had this fabulous list of, of stuff. And he has these words related to understanding our interdependence. And for me, it's all expressions of relational hungers. Check it out. See if it makes sense to you. Honesty. Love. Reassurance. Respect. Support. Trust. Understanding, acceptance, appreciation, closeness, community, consideration, contribution to be an enrichment of life, emotional safety, empathy. It sounds to me like these are naming quite a few relational hungers. So what would happen if we allowed these into awareness, tracked them, and noticed how we were navigating them? Notice when we made a story about when we're screwed or not screwed, depending on the person that we have isolated as being the sole person responsible for making sure that these needs are are met. or not. We notice it as an arising, we watch it, and then we finesse our way around it. How can we get our needs met if the person who I'm in relationship with is not meeting those needs? And there's many different things that we can do. We can ask, we can express, and we can see if we can get them met someplace else. So, when Mr. Growley came out, I was not interested in negotiating with him to get any of my needs met. (laughs) (laughs) But it didn't mean I couldn't get my needs met. So somehow we create a story that all of my needs are dependent on you And if you're not given them, I'm screwed. Well, how all of this has come into being is quite complex. And we don't need to figure all of that out. But what we need to do is watch this pattern and begin to see if we can finesse it, observe it, see the space around it, not believe it, and watch what happens when we do that. The way in which our relational hungers connect to our health in being able to trust and being able to receive is a profound conversation. And I think this is part of like Sharon's and I's longing to have this retreat extend to 30 days where we could begin to unpack pieces of this and actually name and know and understand the way that all works. So we'll just tag it that it's present and know that we're not going to be able to unpack it completely. But it's part of our health in developing a healthy sense of who we are in relationship to the world. And so therefore, knowing when this stuff gets activated and triggered is part of our health in healing and in shifting the sense of anxiety that we have about ourselves in the world into something that might be more trusting. It's not trivial to track this stuff.
So what I'd like is for everyone to stand up and walk around. <laughs> <laughs>